Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Latin American Directions. My name is Nicolas Sussman, and today we have our guest, Jimena Medellin, a lecturer and researcher from CIDE in Mexico, uh, to talk a very, about a very interesting, sensitive, and important issue, uh, and very current issue, the case of Ayotzinapa, uh, a situation that took place actually eight years ago on the 26th and 27th of September uh, in Mexico. And uh, well, let's have Jimena tell us about the case. Jimena, welcome. It's great to have you here and to get your insights from this case. Hello, Nicolas. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about, as you said, this very uh, sensitive, sad, but relevant case in Mexico. Yes. Uh, so, Jimena, I think let's start by providing some context to our audience. If you could just briefly tell us what happened uh, on the 26th and 27th of September 2014 uh, in this Ayosinapa case. Exactly. When we talk about the Ayotzinapa case, we are actually referring to um, tax carried out, especially by local police police forces, um, or starting with local police forces against several people. It's not so, it's not only the the forty three students that we normally concentrate in, but there were so many other victims. Um, so this happened during the night and the early hours of the 27th, the, the 26th and the 27th of September of 2014, as you said. Um, and it was followed by the disappearance of these 43 students. The, the, the case or the, the facts actually took place in Iguala, which is a city of the southern state of Guerrero in Mexico. Uh, but we call it Ayotzinapa because the students, the 43 students, were actually doing their um, training program to become um, teacher professionals, professionals or teachers for for um, elementary school in Ayotzinapa, which is one of the small towns in Guerrero. So that is what we mean when we said Ayotzinapa, again, we concentrate a lot on the disappearance of the 43 students, but there are more victims and that is always important to remember. Right, so let's let's talk about the students first and then how the events evolved after that. Uh, so the, as you say, the main uh, victims or the attention has been directed to this 43 students. They were trying to get to Mexico, if I understood correctly, to participate uh, in, in some demonstrations. And then they had some clash with the local authorities uh, in collaboration, perhaps, or related to, to some uh, illegal armed groups and one, what happened uh, during this situation. Well, that's part of what is complicated around the case, because we don't really know what happened. I mean, we know certain things as a fact. We know that they disappeared. We know, as you said, that they were in Iguala, that they took some uh, buses, that they were trying to get somewhere um, using those, those, those trucks. Um, but it's not perfectly clear where they they were going or what they wanted. There are different versions of, of what happened or what were their intentions. Um, but they took these these um, buses, they, it was an illegal taking, let's just say. It. And part of the theories or one of the theories is that one of those um, buses had drugs inside of, of, of it. And it was part of a, of a network of drug trafficking towards the United States. So one that's at least one of the theories that had been uh, put forward to try to explain the case or the violence that these students suffered. But they were distributed in five different buses and all of the all of these transports were um, attacked by the local police, as you said. Um, and some of the students, those that were not killed or badly harmed during the attack, um, were um, detained, illegally detained, and then everything points to um, to them being hand over to one of the criminal groups, local criminal groups, um, 
And after that, everything gets more complicated because the first theory that the government put forward was that they were executed and then that they were their their bodies were born in um, the Kukula um, dumping site. Mm -hmm. um, and after that theory was questioned by one of um, an independent group and of, of international experts, um, that theory started to crumble. And everything pointed out that the students were not really, the bodies of the students were not really burned in that specific site. So then the question became, so where are they? Are they still alive? Um, what happened to their bodies if they were not um, burned in that in that specific site? Um, and that has been part of, of, of the whole saga that we are still trying to discover, not we as a society, I mean, we as a society, but especially their families. Right, right. And then my question would be, why did this become such an important case, not only for the society, I think it is shocking enough to become a social concern, but for the government, and, and don't take me wrong in this, but coming from countries that undergo severe violence, these cases are not uncommon, right? So why this one was so concerning for the government? It's great that you point that out because we need to remember that in Mexico, we have at this point more than 100,000 people who are considered disappeared. Um, either, I, I, I mean, not found. That's the, the, the phrase that the government wants to use because not it's not clear either if all of those people have been forced have been victims of, of a forced disappearance or if they just left um and no one knows their whereabout or if they were victims of any other crime. So so we are only talking about people who are missing or are not really or haven't been found. Um, but we have over 100,000 uh, people in that situation. So exactly, I mean, the, what you point is, it's a very, it's a breaking point, I would say, in the in the public debate about around the violence in Mexico. Up to that point, the government had been very skillful, I would say, to say that all the victims of the violence that we have been experiencing especially since 2007, um, were part of, of normal violence among, among criminal groups. Um, so they had created this narrative that as long as you were a good citizen, that you behave well, that you were not involved in, dro in drug trafficking, no one will ha nothing will happen to you or would happen to you. And Ayotzinapa, it's a breaking point for that narrative. Ayotzinapa, it was very, very early, it became clear that these students had nothing to do with drug trafficking. I mean, in the very, very early um, stages, like I would say the next day, the government tried to start leaking that idea in the society. But um, the families and the NGOs that, that were um, embracing the families very quickly were very skillful to um, dismount or to, to reverse that narrative. So the government very quickly had to accept that the students had nothing to do with the drug trafficking, that they were really victims of a senseless, senseless attack, um, and the, the public pressure grew very fast. So within a couple of days, we had people on the streets um, demanding justice and demanding more explanation, and that just grew with the, the in the next within the next months, um, and that put a lot of pressure in the Mexican government. So the Mexican government wanted an answer and wanted it very fast to try to to bring down all the protests and and not to let this grow out of control. Right. Right, and just to set the record clear, I know you don't have the answer, and I know there are many hypotheses. Uh, so we mentioned one hypothesis that is that they got caught up in this drug dealing scheme, and one of the bosses was involved, and they were in the crossfire. But there's also 
uh, I know a hypothesis that they were becoming uncomfortable for the local government, right? Because they were demonstrating, they were calling uh, about things that were not properly done at the local level. And perhaps that is one of the other reasons why the, they were disappeared. What do you think about that? Do you think it's it's believable? Do you think it's a combination of everything? I mean, it's truly, truly difficult at this point to say one way or another. Um, yeah, there was the, there was some uh, some part of the one some of the explanations that were given at some point is that they were gonna um, go to protest against, um, especially the wife of the local official, the 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 presidente municipal, the the head of the county. Let's just say. Um, that she was going to give a speech and explain about some of the um, achievements of the government and that they wanted to protest against it. Um, it sounds more and more unlikely that that is the, the main explanation. And that became more and more unlikely once we came to realize the extent of the, the, the number of not only people that participated in this attack, but the level, the, the involvement of different um, corporations, either federal, state, or local corporations, uh, police, police forces, and even the military, which was, you know, one of the the biggest red flags that that not very early, but at some point came to, to into the light. Um, just protesting against the local a local official. Not even the the official himself, but the wife of a local official turns very difficult to explain why the military would get involved in this in in attacking or uh, covering up the attack of the students because that is also I mean at this point in the last couple of weeks we have learned some new information that the new government that the 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 president Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador administration has been bringing to light. And now there is this possibility that the, the military was very much involved since the disappearance, since the very early hours. And actually that part of the one part, part of the students, some of the students um, were under the control of the military since the beginning and that those students actually survived for a few days, that they were not killed in the first the first day as the rest of them were. Um, and again, just the idea of um, some students, a group of students protesting against some local authorities do not explain the, the, the level of involvement of so many different corporations, um, institutions and, and bodies. Right, right, and and that's a perfect segue for for my next question. Right, we know Mexico is a federal state, uh, and it operates in, in in the federal and the and the local level, the state level, the municipal level. At what points does this become an issue of interest for the federal government and for federal mm -hmm. authorities? I know there's recent information that changes everything that has been discussed over the over the last years. Uh, but, but for me, it's interesting. For me, the question is, this is something that seems local and all of a sudden it becomes a national case, a federal case with involvement mm -hmm. from federal actors from all nature, right? The military, but also the prosecution, the attorney general, the national government even. Uh, so, so before moving on to the role of these authorities, when do we, does this become a national, a federal issue and not just a local or state or state situation? That happened very early in the in the in in the case. Um, it was actually, I think, two or three weeks after the fact that um, the federal prosecutor, the general attorney, actually um, took over the case. Again, that happened very fast, and it was basically due to, or at least that's what we believe, or that's what it's been assumed that that happened because of the public pressure. That was building up, and the presidency um, wanted it to end as fast as as they could. So um, the federal prosecution takes over the case, basically takes it from the hands of the local prosecution, the the state prosecutor, the Guerrero prosecutor, um, 
And a few months after that, the general attorney comes out on this press conference to announce the historical truth of the Ayotzinapa case, which has become almost like a slogan for the uh, fight against impunity in Mexico. La verdad histórica has become like a breaking point where basically the general attorney at that point says, this is the real truth. This is what we accept as the truth. This is what happens. And there is nothing else to discuss. And that's it. Um, and again, at that point, we already had the, the, the representatives of the families have already requested some cautionary measures from the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And because of those of, the, of that request, um, the Mexican government had to accept the creation of the um, international group of expert, independent experts. I'm sorry, I was thinking about the name in Spanish. Um, Hiei, that's how we um, how it became to be known in Mexico. So Hiei had already been agreed. The creation of Hiei, Hiei had already been agreed. The the specific people that at the end was part of Hay, I think were not appointed yet. But once the names were revealed, that was actually a great day, I think, for, for many of the um, people that work in human rights in Mexico, because once we saw the, the, the people who were actually going to be part of Hay, we recovered the hope. We said, okay, there is some hope to actually find the truth because there were people with uh, persons with a lot of um, great reputation, with a lot of um, fantastic backgrounds in fights against impunity in different countries. And once he started to actually investigate the case, a lot of doubts started to come out. And that's where um, this, this historical truth started to be questioned left and right. And the families became very, very suspicious about everything that the government was putting forward. Right, right. So, so this is very interesting, right? So, which, so we have some sort of labeling by the prosecution say this is the truth, right? Even using a, a very strong legal term called historical truth that actually is like a closing reparations term for victims just to say this is what happened and we will be over with this case we already solved it right but then the pressure let me say let me say even worse it's probably something that that lawyers are trained to never said mm -hmm. you know we are always trained to say this is the legal truth mm -hmm. but never talk about historical truth because you can never guarantee that with the the the, the evidence that you mm -hmm. have you can actually you can say that that is what is being proven but you're you are never to absolutely assure that that is the 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 truth and the full truth and nothing but the truth. Absolutely, absolutely. And then we have the family saying, "No, this isn't happened. No, the citizenship also this isn't happening." So I want to stop uh, for a minute and rewind our movie a bit and ask you what happened with the families, with the civil societies since the beginning, because I believe. It's the key to to unraveling this case, right, and not not allowing it to stay as the as the government initially wanted. So, in the in the aftermath of the situation, what happened, and how did civil society and the families organize themselves? Well, first to call uh, for the for the HIA establishment, and then to move the case and keep it alive eight years later, right? I mean. <laughs> That is another <laughs> another part of the case which has uh, somehow been, I would say, a little bit controversial. Um, let me say that because both the, the the group of families and probably or especially the the NGOs who have been um, representing the the families have been have have created this very tight um group that is almost impossible to penetrate <laughs> you know th th they have been very jealous about not allowing and and i i mean not allowing many people to get their hands on on the case um 
there are different opinions about this strategy, you know, as it normally happens with such a public case and such public um, atrocity. Some people say that there have been extremely cautious and and that they should be more um, willing to cooperate with other NGOs and with other organizations and movements in Mexico to try to put forward a more comprehensive agenda of fight against impunity, because obviously they have almost become one of the most known or recognizable um, cases and faces that that signifies the the process of violence in Mexico. So for many people, if the families and the their representatives agree to join forces with other movements and with other cases, that would mean a lot for the fight against impunity and that will strengthen a more common agenda. Right. I mean, I'm not one. I'm. I'm no one to judge either way. I mm -hmm. think um, that's something that really belongs to the victims and how they want to organize. The way that they explain their cases, the way that they communicate with society, the the, the legal strategies. Um, but at some point, I would say that I have to. At least I understand what they have done it, because many cases it has been the experience that many cases go from one hand to another and they change so many strategies and 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 they become so politicized that that the true uh, goals and the 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 interest of the victims um, evaporate through all this process, even with the best intentions of, of different organizations that get involved in the case. Right. So they have, they, have, um, they have kept this very, very tight, again, group um, with, with a very clear strategy, I think. They have been very willing to cooperate with the government, which is another thing that has been criticized. Um, some different different actors have um, expressed the opinion that that they should be more demanding towards the government, that they should not agree to everything, um, especially with this new administration that is a different one from from the one that was um, in power when when the the attacks happened. I think there was a lot of of trust that this new administration will have a different um, take on the on the case and that there was real political will to advance the investigations and to to find the truth. So, for example, they agreed to participate in a presidential commission that was tasked with investigating the case. And at the same time, there was an special prosecutor appointed to carry out the, the criminal investigations. Um, what has happened in the last couple of days, and we are really talking in the last couple of days, actually today we had the breaking news that the special prosecutor just resigned from his post, was that the president, Andres Manuel López Obrador, decided to basically trust more on what the presidential commission has done and not the special prosecutor. And that is a very complicated scenario because the special prosecutor had created a very, very well, I would say, well and, and careful link with the families. There was a lot of trust between the special prosecutor and the families. Um, there was obviously trust between the commission and the families, but the families have recognized that the special prosecutor was finally um, taking clear steps to not only find the truth, but find the, those responsible for the attacks and not only those that had materially carried out the attacks, but those who were in other positions of powers that could be involved 
in uh, or have participated in different ways in in this in this um, in these attacks and the follow disappearance, which is a crucial part of it as well. Um, but apparently there is some disagreement between the presidential commission and the special prosecutor or on who should actually be responsible or named responsible for or accused to carry out these attacks and especially um, some members of the, the army was part of the, the apparent apparently big disagreement between the, the presidential commission and the, which is more sort of a inquiry commission or a truth commission, but it's not a prosecutor. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think you did a, a really good summary of, of the current situation, right? So I would say that it's a, despite how bad the case is, it has been bitter, a bittersweet experience, right? A very a bad experience at the beginning, right, with the government trying to set up a cover-up that was clearly uh, discredited by the HIA and then supported by the other investigations, but also new breakthroughs with the Inquiry Commission and then with the special prosecutor. But then again, at this moment, just in the last days, we see uh, a drawback, right, with, with, with the uh, resignation of the special prosecutor who who is the one as you say that eventually could lead into convictions right which is perhaps the yeah, form of justice the the families of, of the victims want uh so maybe my last question and and, and it was uh would be what is your anticipation of what could happen and maybe uh take a short takeaway just to close the show i could ask you questions for hours about this case uh but just to Give uh, our audience with a takeaway so they keep an eye on this on this case and and we see how it develops because it has been eight years it has been an active case uh, during eight years which is surprising to some degree uh, for what we see in our in our region uh, and also yeah just to keep it around I think important it's very important for the community both in Mexico and in the rest of the region to keep an eye on it so we can have some justice for this for this sort of violations i mean i think i think we will keep seeing or um keep witnessing this attempts to um continue or move forward with the criminal cases i don't think the criminal cases are are over but at the same time i think they're they're losing the the general attorney the office of the general attorney is losing a, a key um element of uh, that that was gonna um if not guarantee but to improve the the odds of success um in the actual trials i think the the resignation of the special prosecutor really um puts everything at risk everything that has been gained through the criminal investigation it's my opinion that is it's seriously at risk and and we might see everything crumble again um we can still have the the presidential commission but again that is more of a fact finding commission it's not criminal investigation but now the office of the general attorney is going to basically try to support everything in the criminal trial based on the work of the um, the presidential commission. And I think that's going to lead to a lot of problems of due process and um, probably illegality on some of the, or questioning the legality of some of the evidence, so on and so forth. So I think everything is going to get more complicated. And all of this new entanglement has basically uh, happened because our president, the Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, I would still want to believe with the best intentions, is trying to move for, to move forward the case, but with very little respect of due process and the institutions that should be in charge of these type of cases. Um, he wants to be in control. He wants his commission, the presidential commission, to be. Um, the, the leading um, voice on all this process. And 
we need to understand that that is not the place of a fact-finding commission. A fact-finding commission has a place, and it could be very important to unveil some of the truth, to unveil some of the facts that might not be that might not come to life in a criminal process. But the criminal process has specific rules, and we need to observe and, and respect due process if we really want to create a new scenario of justice in Mexico. And again, as you said, Nicolas, this is one case. This is 43 people that are absolutely important as every human being is. But we have over 100,000 people who are still missing in Mexico. If every single investigation is going to take us more than eight years, we're never going to find the truth and we're never going to find justice. We need to move forward to, to create, to establish new um, bodies, probably extraordinary uh, bodies. Probably we need to start talking about um, transitional justice teams to really, really respond to the level and the amount of atrocities that have been committed in Mexico during the past 10, 15 years. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we'll keep an eye on the case. Jimena Medellin, thank you so much. And to our audience, thank you for viewing us. This was Latin American Directions. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.